Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Each and every special welcome to my friends. Blue Mountain boys and girls are here. Remember that story I made up about playing and singing in the, in the band? Here's the proof right here tonight. It's good to see all of you. Are you ready to travel? A few evenings back, I had a little quiz, if you'll recall. I said, we're going to go to the city that's said to be the most romantic in all the world. And several of you said Paris. You remember that? And I said, no, not Paris, but rather Venice. Well, tonight, we're going to go to Paris. The Kingston Trio sang it, I suppose, for all of us and best. When they sang, a young man goes to Paris as every young man should. For something in the Paris air does a young man good. This city, like the major cities of the world, born on the banks of a river. Here, of course, it's the river Seine. And we oftentimes would pronounce it Seine. No matter how you say it, it means the fisherman's net, you know, that that he catches fish in. On the banks of the Seine is the chief identifying feature of the city, that is the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower was built for the World Exposition that was held here at the turn of the prior century. About 1898, 1900, right in then, this, the Eiffel Tower was built. And when the thing was built, the folks just had a fit about it. The locals denigrated it. They put it down and they protested regarding the thing. They said, our city is a city of wide streets and lovely boulevards, beautiful statues, and here you build this iron skeleton in the midst of all of it. Tear it down. And now they're more proud of it than any other single feature, I think, in the whole city. For those of you with an engineering background and interest, it is what is known as a perpendicular cantilever. Now that, to me, sounds like a contradiction of terms, but in any event, that's what it is. And uh, at the top of it, and by the way, when you go to the top, you're up nearly 1,000 feet high. I was up there once. I'm never going again. <laughs> the breeze was blowing, and that thing was going back and forth like this, and I didn't have my sea legs. And besides that, I'm afraid of heights. I sometimes fear I shall fall from here. Atop that, uh, the, the, there's a restaurant up the very top of it, out at about the 800 or 850 foot level. And then there are towers that go up another 200 feet. And atop those towers are the lights of warning. And there are television antennas and radio things and all like that. And some poor guy has to go up there every other day to check the bulbs and polish the lenses. I'm glad that's not my job. Couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. Well, there are many other things to see. I want you now to take a look at the city from an aerial vantage point. The city was born on an island in the middle of the River Seine, a natural island. And this city today is divided by that. When you look upstream the island, it is then divided right bank and left bank. And you've heard them talk about the city of Paris that way. The artists, you know, the, the sculptors and the painters, they're, they're left bank people. And the folks from Idaho, they put over on the right bank. <laughs> well, there is one thing here that folks come to see on the island largely, and that is this lovely, lovely Gothic cathedral. Many say, and I think I would agree, that it is the most lovely Gothic cathedral in the world. Notre Dame de Paris, we simply say Notre Dame, the cathedral of Notre Dame, our Lady of Paris. And every time I see this picture, my mind goes back to that movie that I saw when I was a bit younger, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You remember him? Old Quasimodo lived up in there amongst the bells. And he wasn't very pretty, but he was kind and sweet and good. And, and he saved that street girl, you know, hit her up there from the revolutionary mobs and all, and, and then finally he fell from a gargoyle at the end of the story. That movie has been made on at least four separate occasions, and from time to time someone will ask me, which is your favorite? And I still like the Lon Chaney one best. 
I think it's near to the facts and near to history. And so that's my favorite of all. We're going to talk more about the gargoyles in just a little bit. But before we do that, let me just tell you this. When I was here, there was a man that was arrested when he came down from the top of those towers. You can go up the stairway and go in and amongst the bells. You don't want to be there when the bells strike the hour because your ears are going to ring. But this guy had a, a knack for walking a tightrope or a wire, you know. And he had snuck up there somehow under the cover of darkness, I don't know, but he got his cable with him and somehow he stretched it between those towers and tied it off. And then when the crowd was gathered by the hundreds down here in front of the cathedral, he walked between those two towers up there about 300 feet high, I think, or something like that. Well, he paid his fine, but he had his 15 minutes of fame. Now, I want you from across the banks of the Seine River to have a look at this cathedral because this is said to be the finest example of the flying buttress style of architecture. A flying buttress is nothing more or less than an arm that has a foundation several feet out and away from the wall of the church, and that arm reaches up and supports the wall just below where the roof sits atop and when you support the roof in that way, you can leave vast openings in the wall and fill those openings with stained glass. And that they have done here. Oh, and by the way, if ever you go to Paris in the summertime or when the weather's really nice, take a boat ride at sunset down the River Seine. And they have a, a program, lights flash on the buildings and the loudspeakers tell you the story and give the history behind it all. And I found it very relaxing as well as informative. The flying buttresses of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. This, for your interest's sake, by the way, was completed in 1193. That's been a while back, huh? Still standing strong. Well, from the top we look upstream and we see where the river forks, right bank and left bank, and we see the tour boats coming down and it's a good ride. Now, in front of the cathedral itself, there are folks by the dozens, sometimes by the hundreds, and of course, everyone has a camera or two, uh, but many have easels with drawing pads. Maybe they're doing chalk work. Maybe it's pencil drawing, or maybe it is watercolor or oil or something else, but they're painting the facade, the front of the church, because it is such a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. And we're going to begin to look at it right now. Above the doors of entry, there is King's Row. There they are. They stand about 18 feet high. Each has a crown on his head and a scepter in his hand. And during the French Revolution, an angry mob scaled the wall and men vented their anger by putting ropes around the necks of those statues and pulling them down and smashing them to pieces. And when they were asked, why did you do that? They said, because we want to show our anger and our disrespect for the kings of France who've sold us out. And then it was explained to the mob that these statues never symbolized the kings of France, but the Bible kings from the time of Saul and David right down to the time of Jesus. Well, fortunately, they've been beautifully replaced and restored. But it is indeed one of the most beautifully carved facades that I have ever seen. Now, to give you a little bit of a feel for the size, way up at the top of the screen, there is King's Row, right up there, and down here, the entry doors, and then way at the bottom of the screen there, the heads of the people. Now, between the doors of entry, there is a carving of Jesus done in marble, and on either side then, six of his disciple apostles. I want to take you inside, but first a close-up, if you'd like, of those beautiful marble carvings. And again, you just have to sort of pinch yourself to be reminded that this is done hundreds of years ago by men with crude tools, by our measurements today, hammers and chisels in their hands. I think they did a good job. Well, here they are on either side of Jesus there in the very middle, and and all kinds of other Bible stories carved beneath them. You recall that we have said on more than one occasion that these great cathedrals were built during the Dark Ages when folks were largely illiterate. But if they were able to read or write, they couldn't read the Bible, for Bibles were literally chained to monastery desks. And so in order to teach them the Bible stories, 
that they were permitted to hear and know, they would decorate the churches with a statue, with a monument, with a painting, with a stained glass window, or some other illustrative device, and then take the folks on tours throughout the cathedrals or around the exterior, as in this case, and tell them the Bible stories that go along with it. Now, we're ready then to step inside. Through the entry door, you're greeted by the Madonna, she after whom the cathedral is named, Our Lady of Paris, with the baby Jesus in her arms. Now, we have also on prior occasions said that a true cathedral must be built in the shape of a cross, that where the folks are seated for worship, that is the main nave, and then at the high altar, there is a wing that goes out on either side, and that's the transept, and then behind that, a little alcove called the apse. And so we're ready then to look down the main nave. I've forgotten how many folks they say they can comfortably seat in here, but, uh, but hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands, a few thousand, as I recall now. And in the apse there, you see some stained glass windows, but the windows that most folk come to see are in the transept, and we're going to look at those. But before we do that, let me remind you again of the style of the Gothic. It is slender and delicate and spaghetti-like as opposed to the Romanesque, which has broad columns and, and big arches and all of that. The basic difference between the two styles. All right? Now, there is a story here in this painting that I want to share with you tonight. For hundreds and hundreds of years, when a king or queen of Europe was coronated, the Pope would come from Rome and he would be given the crown of coronation. And at exactly the right moment, after the bands had played and all of the rest, he would walk down the center aisle of the nave, carrying in his hands the crown. He would step up to the high altar and then he would reach out and place it upon the head of the king or the queen. And that was to show the king, the world, whomever, that the church, the leader of the church, was above the king. And it was like that, ladies and gentlemen, for 1260 years, from about 538 to 1798, when Napoleon put an end to it all, as we're going to talk right now. So it's time for the coronation of Napoleon Bonaparte. He was small in stature, but he was a giant in his own mind. <laughs> or someone said a legend in his own mind. He stood only about, let's see, about five, about four feet and 11 and a half inches in his high-heeled boots. And here's something else that you're going to enjoy about Napoleon. When his picture was painted, when his portrait was made, he always, always wore a three-piece suit. He always wore a vest. And he tucked his hand inside his vest like this. And you've seen pictures like that, haven't you now? Well, I've done a little bit of a research, and I can tell you why he always wore the vest. He had a little pot belly, and he thought that that vest would help hide it. They're cruel, Ron. These people are cruel. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> so let me finish this story now. Let's get back to reality. Here comes the Pope down the aisle. He's carrying the crown. He comes up the high altar, steps up, reaches out to place the crown on the head of Napoleon. And at that instant, Napoleon snatched the crown from the head of the Pope and put it upon his own head to say to the church and to France, and to the world, no one is worthy to crown Napoleon except Napoleon. And shortly afterward, he would make the Pope a captive. And we're going to go out to the Palace of Fountain Blue tomorrow night, by the way, in our travel. We're going to go to Fountain Blue, and we're going to walk through the suite of rooms where the Pope was made a captive. So be sure to be here on time to travel with me. And so history has been made here in so many different ways, but none, I think, more fascinating than at the time of the coronation of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now we're going to begin to walk around the high altar, and it's covered 
up at about the 15-foot level with carvings that have been painted with oil paint and then much of it encrusted with gold leaf. And here Bible stories are told. We'll begin over at the extreme left because this is where the story begins. Here we see Herod the Great. He has a scepter and he has a crown. And he's giving an order to his armies of the Roman legions. They're to go to Bethlehem and destroy the little baby boys two years of age and younger. But the Holy Family has been warned and there go Joseph and Mary. Joseph's leading the little burrow and there's Mary and the baby Jesus in her arms. They're going to go down to Egypt for a couple of years. We move on around to the opposite side and we come to the end of the ministry of Jesus and we see his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem and the folks are throwing their coats before him and laying palm fronds in front of his little animal there and then finally we find him in the upper room washing the feet of his disciples and then sharing with them the Lord's Supper. A spiritual washing before the eating of that spiritual meal. And so again, further evidence of the way folks were taught the Bible stories from the decorations in and around the cathedrals. Now, I told you we were going to enjoy the beauty of the rose windows. Here they are. Those frames, ladies and gentlemen, are about 28 feet in diameter. And every single frame tells a different Bible story. This one and this one and this one. They all, and these down beneath them, and now we can easily see the advantage of that flying buttress so they can leave the wall empty and fill it with beautiful stained glass. This is the West Rose window, and the one on the opposite side is like it, only different in that it tells different Bible stories. You can imagine the folks being brought here, can't you now, and the pastors pointing out this frame and telling them the Bible story and explaining the next and the next and right on down the line. I was privileged to go inside the treasury. You cannot go without armed guards accompanying you at any time, and rarely can a person go, but with special permission and asking in advance, we were granted the ability, four of us, to go inside the treasury. And I think there were four or five armed guards for each of us, and so we made quite a group. But inside the treasury, there are scores, ladies and gentlemen, of crucifixes and, um, and little altars of incense and other relics that are pure gold, pure solid gold. The wealth of the Church of Rome is um, inestimable. Really, it is. The Bank of Rome, the Vatican Bank is, um, I suppose, if not the most wealthy bank in all of the world, we're going to go again to Rome in a few evenings, and I may forget, so I'll tell you now. But the Vatican owns all of the utilities in the whole of the city of Rome. All of the lights, all of the water, all of the sewer system, all of the gas, that sort of thing is owned by the church. And so it's quite obvious that they have a nice income, and we see just a little bit of the evidence of it here. Now, we're up atop the cathedral, and was standing beside the gargoyle from which Quasimodo fell in the movie. My son Troy was with me. He's our youngest. And Peggy stayed down at the ground level. She was still admiring some of the marble, carbi uh, marble carvings and all, but we climbed the staircase and went up and in amongst and through the bells, and then we came over beside this gargoyle. And we each had a camera with us. And I stood up against this gargoyle and I said to my son, Troy, if you don't mind, take my picture. And he picked up his camera and focused and had his hand on the trigger. And then he put it down. And he said, Dad, what do you plan to do with this picture? And I said, well, I, I don't know for sure. I said, I suppose it depends a little bit on how it turns out and all. And Troy said, you weren't thinking about putting it in your travelogue, were you? And I said, well, to be honest, the thought had come across my mind, all right. No way, he said, no picture. Why, I asked him. 
I said, because you're going to confuse the folks, that's why. <laughs> I want to thank you for traveling with me. And now to our subject of the evening, the hour of God's judgment. Please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. We've alluded to this passage on several prior occasions and must begin with it tonight. Revelation chapter 14 carries within it those three very special messages to the terminal generation by the three angels, those three messengers sent from God's throne. And I'm going to begin to read now at verse 6 and ask you to follow carefully. We'll read verses 6 and 7. Revelation chapter 14, beginning with verse 6. I saw then another angel flying in the midst of heaven, and he had the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell upon the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. That takes our minds back, doesn't it? Our study last night, the final command of Jesus from Matthew chapter 28, where he said to his disciples, go into the whole world and take the gospel, and he that believes and is baptized, the same shall be saved. And so we see a connection here again tonight. This is a message that's to go to the whole world. This is the good news about Jesus and about the righteousness of God. This must be preached to the whole world, to every man that dwells upon the earth, every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And then verse 7, and said, he said with a loud voice, fear God. Now, if you have a newer translation, something different from the King James, it very likely says reverence God or honor God. It doesn't mean to be afraid of God at all, but rather to reverence God. Reverence God and give Him glory for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship He who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Now I want you to know that there are two things here that go together hand in glove. One of them is this special message about the judgment hour of God and together with that really, locked tightly to it, is this idea of returning to the Creator, the worship of the Creator, He who made the heavens and the earth and all of the rest. You remember when about three evenings ago we talked about the origin of the Saturday Sabbath and how it was a memorial to the creative power of God? It was a monument made out of time where a family could come together and be reminded down through the ages that we're not the result of an accident from a primeval pool, but rather we have come from the creative hand of God Almighty. And so here then is this special messenger with this special message announcing the judgment hour of God has begun and turn your minds back toward the creatorship of Jesus. And remember his day of creation. That's implicit within it as well. Our message tonight, ladies and gentlemen, has been designed really by God to answer a number of questions. Questions that I'm asked nearly every week in my ministry. Questions like these. Lyle, where did this Saturday business originate? I mean, I've been in church all my life, and, and my great-granddaddy was a preacher, and, and I've never heard much about it until fairly lately. Why? Why was that? Why didn't Martin Luther sh shout it from the rooftop, uh, begin to keep the Saturday Sabbath? Why? Why is it such a Johnny-come-lately sort of a notion? And then this second question, where and when and how did the Seventh-day Adventist church originate? And I'm asked that question more and more often recently because the Seventh-day Adventist church today, ladies and gentlemen, is the fastest growing Protestant church in all of the world. And if time allows, we shall say more about that before we conclude. And so we're going to, in our Bibles tonight, find the answers to these questions. But before we read more from the Revelation, let's go back to the Psalm. Leave a bookmark here at Revelation. Uh, maybe a, turn back to chapter 10, 11. Leave your mark there, and then we shall go together to the Psalms. I want to read to you a verse from Psalm number 20 that's very fitting, at least to my mind tonight, and I think it shall be to yours as well. Just before... Uh, the Proverb Job and Psalms and then the Proverbs. Chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Psalm number 20, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 20, verse 1. May the Lord hear you in the day of trouble. And may the name of the Lord God, Jacob, be, defend you. And then this next verse, listen carefully, and send you help from, now you tell me what it says in your Bible. Send us help from where now? There it is. Send us help 
from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. Send us help, Lord, from the sanctuary. Tonight, we're going to study the sanctuary and we're going to share together the beauty of its teaching and we're going to see in it the love of God and the, the, the great love of our Father as well. I want you now then to go with me to Revelation chapter 10. I'm going to read the entirety of that chapter and then as time allows, several verses from the 11th chapter as well. And while we're turning back to Revelation chapter 10, let's be reminded, as we have on prior evenings, that much of the book of Revelation is symbolic. In fact, I think it's safe to say that most of the book of Revelation is written in terms of symbols. And there was a reason for that, of course. The Bible was protected from its enemies who couldn't understand the symbolisms, you see. So God saved the information, couched the information in symbols, so that we who live in the last day, the eternal generation, could be blessed by the information and, and the revelation not be destroyed by those who are described uh, symbolically in it. All right? Chapter 10, symbolic indeed, and we're going to begin with the first verse. John in this vision says, I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven. He was clothed with a cloud, and he had a rainbow upon his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book that was, now you tell me what it says. What does it tell us about this little book? It was open. We're going to notice that again and again in this passage. And because of the emphasis upon the little books being open, we can know that at one time or at some time or another, the little book was closed. But this angel now has in his hand a little book that is open. The angel put his right foot upon the sea and his left upon the earth, and he cried with a loud voice like when a lion roars. And when he cried, the seven thunders began to utter their voices. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. And then I heard a voice from heaven that said, Seal up the things which the seven thunders have uttered, and do not write them. Don't write it, John, not yet. And then the angel that I saw, that I saw standing upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand toward heaven and swear by him who lived forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things there in the earth and the things that are there in the sea and things that are there in that time should be no longer, no more time. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he begins to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he's declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the little book that's now open in the hand of the angel, the one that stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to that angel and I said to him, Give me that little book. And he said, Take it and eat it up. And it'll be in your mouth as sweet as honey, but it will make your belly bitter. And so I took the little book from the hand of the angel and I did eat it up and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. But as soon as I had eaten, my belly was bitter. And then... He said to me, you must prophesy again before many nations and tongues and peoples and kings. All right, now let's make some basic review here. It's fascinating, this symbolic information. <clears throat> the whole experience revolves itself, gathers itself around this little book. And every time we see the angel, we see the book. And four times we're told that it is indeed a little book. And twice we're told that the book is open. And once we're told the nature of a book, it is the book of prophecy. Thou must prophesy again. Now this question comes to us, naturally really. Where in the stream of time would this prophecy regarding the little book find a fulfillment? Our very first night together we said that prophecy is history written in advance. It's God's pulling aside the veil that hides the future and giving us a glimpse into what's out there so that we can make preparation. And on the other hand, history is the mirror reflection of prophecy. It is prophecy fulfilled and prophecy and history go together like identical twins. Thus then the question, where in the stream of time would this prophecy become history? Now we have several clues, and we're going to begin to look at them right now. Clue number one, for those of you who take notes, clue number one, as we look at where this prophecy finds its fulfillment. In the days of the voice of the, which angel? The third? Uh, the seventh angel, exactly right. The seventh angel. 
in all of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, but particularly in the book of Revelation, the number seven is a special number. It's unique. The Sabbath is unique. It's the seventh day of the week. And we've said that again and again. But here we have the seventh angel. Now, when in the Revelation you come to number seven, whether it's the trumpets or the plagues or the churches or whatever else, that's the end of it. It's over. That's it. That's the finality. This then is the seventh angel, and he's just beginning his sounding. Moreover, it tells us then that at this time the mystery of God should be finished. We could ask, what is the mystery of God? And we ought to. If we had two or three weeks to put the theology together, I'm sure you'd agree with me that the mystery of God is the power of the gospel. We can't explain it. I see it in every meeting, and it's miraculous. I see it often demonstrated in men, it seems. Men who've never had any interest in the things of God or Christ, Maybe you've never been to church before, and they'll come maybe to just one meeting or one worship service, and they sort of get hooked, and they continue to come, and the Holy Spirit begins to fill their hearts and their minds and their lives and habits that have held them in a vice grip maybe for years and decades suddenly fall off, tobacco or alcohol or cocaine or whatever else. And you can't explain that change life. I've told you how I saw it in my own dad, and I'll tell the story in detail on another evening. It is a mystery. The power of the gospel is a mystery. Just before Jesus ascended, we must allude again, he said to his disciples, go into the whole world and share this good news, take this power out to the ends of the earth, and when the job is done, then I will come again. Now this tells us that the gospel has gone to nearly the whole earth. The mystery of God, the power of the gospel is in its final stages of fulfillment. Mystery of God is near its finishing touches. Now, this angel, the seventh, the last, which carries the message that uh, the mystery of God is in the final stage of fulfillment, also makes a bold statement that time shall be no more. We're now ready to step across from time into eternity where there are no more alarm clocks. How about that? And so this is the seventh angel. He's the last one. His message is that the gospel has nearly gone to the whole world with its miraculous life-changing power, and time shall be no longer. It becomes with these clues quite obvious, I think, to even a casual observer, that the fulfillment of this prophecy has to do with the end times, with the last days. Now, we have alluded on several evenings prior to the time of the falling of the stars predicted by Joel in chapter 2, predicted by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 and in Luke 17 and 21, that there would be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And we talked about how at the turn of the 16th, 17th century, right in there, there was the dark day that had been predicted by Joel and then by Jesus, you remember? And the moon was turned to blood. And then there was the meteoric shower and then that great earthquake. And so we said we believe with good reason, with Bible background and historical knowledge that the last day's pearl began about 1780 right around in there. Now someone might easily say, well, boy, that's been a long time ago. I mean, and here we are, and, you know, in 2000 plus. That's surely been a long time ago. But you know, folks, if I were to stretch across this auditorium a tape that symbolizes the history of the world since the beginning until today, and then I cut off from that tape the amount that would represent from 1780 to today, you know how much it would be? Just about like that. And so when you look at the big picture, in the big scheme of things, suggesting that the last days began about 1780 is not a stretch at all. Now, we're going to summarize once again. We're talking about a little book tonight. We're talking about a book of prophecy. We're talking about a book that was once closed but now open. It was to be opened at the end of time, at the time of the beginning of the sounding of the seventh angel. Now, my suggestion is that we could begin in Genesis and go to Revelation. 
We could do it in the opposite direction, study from Revelation to Genesis. We could begin right in the middle of our Bibles and go both directions, and we'll only find one book of all of the 66 that make up our Bible that fits the demands of Revelation chapter 10. Only one book. And I think you'll agree with me that it is the little Old Testament book of Daniel, of course. Many folks refer to Daniel as the Old Testament apocalypse or the Old Testament revelation. And much of the symbolism, much of the language of the New Testament revelation is borrowed from, directly from, the Old Testament book of Daniel. I'm going to suggest that we turn to Daniel chapter 12, you and I together, and we notice a verse or two. Daniel is writing, ladies and gentlemen, about 560 years before the birth of Jesus. And he's in Babylonian captivity, and he ends every day by looking out on his knees over toward Jerusalem and the Holy Land and praying, Lord, how long until you let us return? How long? How long? When he comes to conclude his book, God tells him exactly how to sign off and we're going to read that together right now. Right now. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal your book until when? Oh, there it is. Close your book. Let it remain closed. Let it remain sealed until the time of the end. And then it says, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I can't begin to explain to you the effect that this verse had upon my mind when first it was explained to me. I mean, I was a young man, but, but the impression it was deep and is lasting, I guarantee you. Let your book remain closed, Daniel. But in the end times, there'll be an explosion of knowledge and technology, and, and men will be running to and fro. And the explanation was continued by my Bible teacher. Imagine the life, in the lifetime uh, of folks who have, have gone from traveling on the back of an animal to, to seeing jets streak across the sky. Imagine. This explosion of technology. I remember so very well in college reading about the first computer, the first real working computer, and it was somewhere in New York City, they said, and I forgot how many floors of one big building, but they told how much information. They said that you could put enough information in that computer. It would take nearly all of the books in all the libraries of all of the cities and universities in the United States. Now, all that much is in that computer. Well, that hasn't been so terribly long ago, folk. This isn't the history of civilization I'm sharing with you now. I mean, it wasn't back in the dark ages when Lyle was in college. But in one lifetime, you know, we've gone from buggies to, to soft landings on the moon. And now, all of that information that took all of those floors in that great big building in New York City can be compressed into that little computer you put inside your watch pocket. It is quite remarkable. And so when this verse was explained to me, the explanation had to do with people leaving vapor trails across the sky, you know, jet airplanes here and there. Amazing. You know, there's an explosion of technology. So it really locked in. It made a lot of sense. Men running to her, knowledge is increased. I want to say to you all tonight that that is a good application of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, a proper application, but it is a secondary application. And many, many Bible prophecies have uh, primary and secondary applications. Folks then ask, well, what is the primary application? Well, to answer that, we look for the subject of the verse. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. What is the subject? Close the doors on the ship. <clears throat> Lock the door on the jet airplane. No. Close your book, Daniel. Let your book remain closed until the time of the end. And in the time of the end, knowledge will be increased. Knowledge about your book. Now, folks ask, rightfully, how then does it plug in the running to and fro? If primarily that isn't men leaving vapor trails across the sky, what then does it mean? In the time of Daniel and for a long time prior and a good while afterward, 
books, well, not as we have them, with backs and pages and so forth, but rather they were scrolls rolled up on sticks. And if we're looking for a passage, say we're looking for Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, and we unroll with this hand and roll up with this hand. No, we went by it, and so we do just the reverse. It took a real manual dexterity, by the way, and when they were doing that, they called it running to and fro through their scrolls. Close your book, Daniel. Let it remain closed until the end time, the last days, and knowledge about your book shall be increased as men run to and fro studying through your book. Now it's time for a history lesson. About 1700 AD, there came a simultaneous international, interdenominational, and independent revival of the study of the book of Daniel. And there was one chapter and one verse within that chapter that grabbed the minds of these scholars and would not let them go. And so we're going to go now, you and I, back to chapter 8 of Daniel, and we're going to notice in a moment verse 14. Daniel chapter 8, and while you're turning, just let me give you again this idea because it is very important. These men were arriving at the same conclusions without collaboration. There was no internet hookup. There was no email. There were no cell phones. It uh, was impossible even to get a letter from this continent to that in less than months. And so here are these men, one in South America, one for sure we know about, several here on this North American continent, many over on the, the continent of Europe, and one out in the Middle East, and they were studying Daniel and arriving at the very same conclusions regarding this passage we're now going to read, chapter 8 and verse 14. Here is the verse that really grabbed them and wouldn't let them go. He said unto me, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And perhaps your Bible says, Then shall the sanctuary be restored to its rightful place. Now, these men universally jumped to the conclusion that the sanctuary here spoken of was planet Earth, and that the cleansing here spoken of was the final fire. And so they said, if we could only discover when this 2300-day period begins, then we'll know when Jesus will come back. And they intensified their search, and the answer to their question as to when this prophecy began was to be found in the study of chapter 9. So we'll go there, and we shall read only just verse 25 for want of time. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the time of the going forth the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. There it was, ladies and gentlemen. There was the event that triggered, initiated this 2300-day prophecy. The longest of all the time prophecies in the Bible. Now, these Bible scholars moreover knew that when you're studying a passage that is clearly prophetic and it mentions a day, you interpret that to mean a literal year a day for a year numbers chapter 14 ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 we've mentioned that before numbers 14 ezekiel 4 6 i have given you a day for a year and so these men said look we're uh, we're not talking about 2300 literal days but 2300 literal years and it tells us that this 2300 year period will begin at the time of the command that allows jews to go back and restore and rebuild jerusalem and so they did what we do here every night they put together with the prophecy history and they discovered that 457 years before the birth of Jesus, there was a command given by a guy by the name of Artaxerxes that allowed the children of, of God to go back from captivity, back to Jerusalem, and not only patch up the potholes, but to restore and rebuild the temple and the whole place. Now, without the aid of calculators or modern math, these men added 2,300 years to 457 before Christ, and they came to the startling notion that Jesus would come back to cleanse the earth about 1843, 1844, sometime right in there. And this idea, folk, lit the fuse to the greatest religious revival the world had known, I think, since the time of Luther and Calvin. I mean, it really changed the Christian world and, and caused a lot of non-Christians to become Christians as far as that goes. Now, <clears throat> your question ought be, and I'm sure it is in many minds, who in the United States were these preachers who believed that Jesus would be back about 1843 or 44? 
Well, there were several. Chief among them in the United States was a man by the name of William Miller. William Miller, like his grandfather before him, was a Baptist pastor. He'd, by the way, been decorated as a, a very brave and loyal soldier at the war uh, at, of 1812 at the Battle of Lake Champlain. And it was after that experience that he went back and began to carefully study the Bible. He'd seen so many horrors in war, and he wanted to get nearer to God. And so William Miller, this Baptist preacher, came to this idea that Jesus was going to be back about 1843 or 1844. Now, by early 43, by, by late 1842, these Bible scholars here in the United States and elsewhere for that matter had arrived at a precise date. Not only just a generality of somewhere between 1843 and 1844, but a precise date. The sanctuary shall be cleansed. Type will follow and a type. And so they began to study the sanctuary system. You remember God took Moses up into a mountain and, and uh, gave him a vision of the sanctuary in heaven. And then he said, go back down and build one just like that. And he told him of the services that went along with it. He said, every evening bring a little animal and take that little animal's life and spill the blood there on the altar of sacrifice. And now symbolically the sins of the people are collecting inside the most holy place. But once a year, a special animal is sacrificed. Special blood is spilled and this blood is taken inside the most holy place. And there it is sprinkled upon the altar of the Ten Commandment Law, the Ark of the covenant. And when that happened, then the sanctuary was cleansed of the sins of the people for the past year. And that became known as the day of atonement, at one men, when the people were brought back into oneness with God. Now, in our calendar, that day of atonement happens on October 22. And so, these Bible scholars and students said, hey, Jesus is coming back, not generally between 1843 and 44, but on October the 22nd of 1844, that's when he'll be back with the cleansing fire. The preaching of this idea, ladies and gentlemen, had the result of dividing every congregation right down the center aisle. Let's suppose that the year is 1843, and this is a Methodist congregation. And a brother over here asks the one over here, tell me, sir, are you an Adventist or are you not? Now, what is he asking? He's asking simply, do you believe that Jesus is going to be back on October 22nd of next year or do you disbelieve it? The point I want to make now is that there were Adventist Baptists, there were Adventist Methodists, there were Adventist Episcopalians, Adventist Catholics, Adventist Presbyterians, Adventist Quakers, Adventist everybody. Time to time, when I'm introduced to Seventh-day Adventist minister, someone will kind of smile and say, Oh, I read about you on the Internet. You, 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 you folks, you're the ones that said Jesus was coming back in 1844. I, I read all about you. And when they say that to me, sometimes I respond like this. What kind of limousine did Abraham Lincoln prefer to ride in? What was his choice? Lincoln Town Car or Cadillac? Huh? Which did he prefer? Oh, that's a silly question. He had no preference, for there were no automobiles. Seventh-day Adventists never said Jesus was coming back in 1844, for there were no Seventh-day Adventists until 1863. But there were lots of wonderfully dedicated Christian folks who believed it and were teaching it and sharing it. That the hour of God's judgment was soon to come. Now, if you know anything at all about Seventh-day Adventists, you know that we lay a great deal of importance upon the heavenly sanctuary. And it's not because I think it's a good idea. Some little lady said that it was important. It's because God said it. I want you to go with me now to chapter 11. And while you're turning to chapter 11 of Revelation, by the way, not Daniel, Revelation again, while you're turning there with me, let me just give you a little bit of the background now. These followers of William Miller and a score of others, 
by early 1844 began to liquidate. I mean, the farmers sold out. And the business folks liquidated their stock. And as they got near and near to October the 22nd, they gave their things away. And they encouraged everyone to do the same, do likewise. Give away your food, uh, cash in, your, bring your money, help us to print a little tract so that we can encourage everybody in town to do likewise. And there were camp meetings that required in New York State a special train to take the folks out to hear that Jesus was coming back on October the 22nd of 1844. This wasn't something done in some dark corner by a bunch of lunatics. This happened on a very broad base. 1844 was the year of the general election. By the way, aren't you about tired of the politics? I mean, months and months yet to go, and I've had it, you know. It's almost to a point where I don't care. You know. Well, equal space was given in the city newspaper to the idea that Jesus would be back on October the 22nd of 44, as was given to the general election. And the two men who ran for the high office that year were Mr. Clay, the gentleman from Kentucky, and James Polk, who became the president of the United States, of course. Now, Jesus did not come on October the 22nd, and they were bitterly, terribly disappointed. Uh, but the prophecy from Revelation 10 said it would be like that. In your mouth it will be sweet as honey. You know, my dears, there is nothing in the world, I think, sweeter to the born again than the thought that Jesus is coming back. Now, the key to the understanding of the disappointment was to be found in the studying of chapter 11. And so we go there to read the very first verse. John is in this vision now, and uh, he, he's seen the, about this book and the angel and all. Now chapter 11, verse 1, There was given unto me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those that worship inside. Now this thing was so real to John that he was on his back. Now he was prostrate. He was down on the back, down on his back. The angel said, get up, John, now get up. Rise and measure. And if we were to put this into modern language, we would say, here's an angel who comes to John the Revelator and says, here, John, take this Stanley Steel tape measure and measure the temple of God. Now, if I were to take a tape measure and measure this lectern, it's this wide and, and it's this high, will it hold my Bible and my notes and this, a book or two, will it? Will it suffice? I'm studying, I'm measuring. You see? Get up, John. Major the temple, study the temple of God and the altar and all that goes on. I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, in your minds now as we move toward a conclusion, to go with me to the temple of God. It was divided, as Moses carefully noted, into two compartments, holy and most holy, sanctum and sanctum sanctorum. And you step into the holy place, and the only light is that that comes from a candelabra over here. It has a central stem with three branches on either side for a total of how many? There it is again, seven, that perfect number. Now, everything in here has to teach us something about the life, the atonement, the death, the ministry, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. We're measuring and we're studying. And when we see the candelabra, we remember that when Jesus came, he said, I am the light of the world. We're measuring and studying. Now over against this wall there is a long and low table atop which there are two stacks of bread, six in each stack for a total of twelve. And remember that when Jesus came he said, I am the bread of life. We're measuring and studying. And now there's only one object left in this holy place and that is the altar of incense. Incense continuously burns there and wafts over into the most holy place. And the incense that burns there, says the Apostle Paul, symbolizes the life of Jesus. Paul said his life is a sweet-smelling savor. And that, by the way, is why we always end our prayer in whose name? In Jesus' name. Amen. And that makes him acceptable into the throne room of God. So we're measuring and we're studying. Now we part the curtain and step into the Holy of Holies, and there's only one article of furniture, and that's a great golden chest. And no ark is important in its own right, but rather becomes important for what it contains. And so we lift the lid and roll it back, and inside we see the Ten Commandment law of God. 
There it is. And we read down through, I am the Lord thy God that has taken thee by the hand to lead thee out of Egypt. Therefore, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images, the likes of anything in the heaven and the earth, the heaven, the earth, the water, beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down before them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the, what? Which day? Remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. What happened on October the 22nd of 1844? Instead of Jesus coming back, I believe, and many theologians with minds far brighter than mine also believe that Jesus, according to the type, stepped inside the Holy of Holies and began his great high priestly ministry for his children. The hour of God's judgment began on that day. And it has nothing to do with being condemned or putting, being put down. This is to vindicate the character of God, you see. God is on trial. We don't know when our names come up, but all who claim Jesus have the name come up in this trial, in this great courtroom scene. The question of the universe is, is Lyle safe to save? God, you surely don't want to take him into your eternal kingdom and run the risk that sin's infection is going to break out again. Surely you have better sense than that. God, are you going to say, and now God is on trial. Revelation chapter 12 speaks about our enemy and calls him the accuser of the brethren. Now, in this courtroom, all the Christians have an attorney. He's not only their attorney, he is their judge. His name is Jesus Christ the righteous. And when the devil, though he's not there in person, he shouts across the universe, God, you can't save Lyle and destroy me. He's a sinner. Surely. And now I'm in big trouble. And now my attorney's... I don't even have to be there. My attorney is there for me. The, the final judgment has been rigged in my favor. Praise Jesus. And my attorney stands up. And he says, Father Lyle is safe to save. He has claimed my blood, my righteousness. And now God is vindicated. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You're our high priest. You're our attorney, our lawyer, and our judge. We don't even have to go to the city hall. We don't even have to go to the courtroom. For you fixed it all in our favor. We don't deserve it. But we tonight again thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.